Yes, hello, it's October 1st. Do you know what that means? It's Spooky Lake Month, where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. And today I wanna to talk about the morbid history of Lake Tahoe. This iconic lake is tucked in the mountains between California and Nevada. It's one of the oldest and deepest lakes in North America. Frigid temperatures below the surface hover around 39 degrees Fahrenheit. For comparison, they keep mortuaries between 34 and 39 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent decomposition, which is how Lake Tahoe has a reputation for holding on to its dead. It's estimated that the remains of some 200 people could reside at the bottom of the lake. This supposed mass graveyard has been dubbed the Tahoe Dance Floor, which is a morbid title to say the least. But cold freshwater lakes can preserve their dead for an incredibly long period of time. The frigid environment would suppress bacteria that causes putrefaction and gases that build up in bodies, causing them to float to the surface. In one case, a diver disappeared in 1994, only to be discovered 17 years later in almost perfect condition. His name was Donald Windecker, and he was last seen by his diving partner as he disappeared into the depths of Lake Tahoe with his mouthpiece removed. He wasn't seen again until 2011 when a group of divers came across his corpse precariously balanced on an underwater shelf 265 feet below the surface. The shelf overlooked a thousand foot drop, so any disturbances could have resulted in his body being lost forever. His wetsuit kept his body intact, but dental records were required to confirm his identity. Four other divers are still missing from that same area, which is infamous for swallowing its victims. Lake Tahoe's icy underwater cemetery is seven out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month. We're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology, and this one is a bit strange. I'm interested in the ominous pools of radioactive water that play a role in nuclear power. These eerie pools kind of remind me of a liminal space. And then you find out that the nuclear waste at the bottom could kill you if you came in contact with it. They're called spent fuel pools, where fuel rods from an active nuclear reactor go when they become obsolete. The rods are very much still radioactive, and they spend sometimes decades beneath the water until they're inert enough to be moved to dry storage. Even the reactor itself is filled with water, providing cooling and shielding from the nuclear fission process. Obsolete rods are plucked from the reactor and moved to the spent fuel pool completely underwater. During this underwater transition from the reactor to the spent fuel pool, you can tell they're still radioactive because of that eerie blue glow. This strange phenomenon is called Cherenkov radiation. To oversimplify, this effect occurs when a particle travels faster than the speed of light in water. But I know what you're really asking yourself. What if you fall into a spent fuel pool? Well, if that were to happen, your first shock might be that they're not cool as they appear, but actually the temperature of a hot tub. The water actually acts as a biological shield that absorbs hydrogen and deflects radiation, to a point. If you were to swim to the bottom and come in contact with the stored fuel, then it would be enough to kill you. In fact, if you were to tread water in a spent fuel pool, you'd be protected from most normal background radiation. That doesn't mean I recommend it because there have been accidents with the divers who are trained to take this type of dip. Radioactive relics consigned to languish at the bottom of a hot pool, four out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we do 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I wanna to talk about Alaska and one of the worst ways you can die. The Cook Inlet stretches over 180 miles from the Gulf of Alaska to the city of Anchorage. This inlet has some of the largest tides in the world, ranging from 18 to 36 feet. As the tide recedes, it leaves behind miles upon miles of mud. These low tides last around six hours, but when the high tide returns, it returns extremely quickly. So fast that people can actually ride the boar tide as it enters the inlet. The mud during low tide is incredibly deceptive. 
One minute it's as solid as a asphalt road and the next it's like walking through jello. Horrifying drawn out deaths have occurred in the mud. In 1988, a young woman who was visiting Alaska got stuck in the mud with her husband. Her husband was able to escape the muddy suction and he spent the next three hours trying to rescue his wife. As the tide started to come in, he left to get help. By the time people arrived back at the scene, the frigid water was up to her neck. They gave her a tube so she could continue to breathe, but the hypothermia was already setting in as the water rushed around her. Her frozen fingers were no longer able to hold the tube for air, and eventually she drowned. It wasn't until six hours later that they were able to retrieve her body, still encased in the mud. Her experience is not dissimilar from the hundreds of accidents that occur at Cook Inlet each year, and while not all those instances end with death, they're all a race against time. As recently as May of this year, a young man who was only 20 got trapped in the mud and eventually drowned. But what causes this oobleck like composition of this specific mud? Cook Inlet is surrounded by glaciers and their enormous weight is grinding mechanically against the bedrock beneath the ice. The result is this incredibly fine silt that's called glacial flour and it's carried to the inlet through waterways and the tide, resulting in hundreds of miles of deadly mud. Take one wrong step and you might be trapped for good. Nine out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today I wanna to talk about the horrifying current situation at the largest lake in the United Kingdom that officials are comparing to an uncapped septic tank. Loch Ness is the largest lake in Northern Ireland. An incredibly large but shallow lake located about 20 miles from the capital, Belfast. It's currently being contaminated by an enormous bloom of toxic blue-green algae. Loch Ness provides 40% of Northern Ireland's drinking water. Never seen algae thick with the consistency of mushy peas like the algae in this viral video. And locals are saying that you can smell the lake from miles away. This type of apocalyptic algae is caused from a variety of reasons. One issue is the excessive discharge from farming and sewage, which causes excess nutrients such as nitrates and phosphates. These excess nutrients initially feed the algae bloom. Eventually, when all of the algae dies, it still causes problems in the form of a dead zone, which is as terrifying as it sounds because it can suffocate life beneath the surface. On top of that, Loch Ness has been fighting the invasion of zebra mussels, which exacerbate the problem. Now, I know I'm just an American, but one aspect of this story completely boggles my mind, and that's that one man owns the majority of this lake. The 12th Earl of Shafshire owns the lake bed and the entire shoreline of Loch Ness. His family has owned it since the 1800s and he inherited it when his father was murdered by his stepmother and his older brother died from a heart attack at the age of 27. On top of that strange piece of history, there's no environmental minister currently because of political strife that's occurring in Northern Ireland. Many lakes in the world suffer from a similar blight to Loch Nye. Unfortunately, this lake might be doomed to wait until the cavalry arrives, which might be a long time in the future. For this terrible, horrible, no good, very bad soup, five out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. And today I wanna to talk about the Roman Empire. Or more specifically, I wanna talk about the morbid history of the Tiber River, which flows through the heart of Rome. This river has witnessed the rise and fall of civilizations, and during the Roman Empire, thousands of souls were lost beneath its surface. This 250 mile river begins in the Apennine Mountains, flows through the city of Rome and drains into the Mediterranean. It served as a source of water and a through line for transportation and trade. However, it was also the cause of deadly destructive floods, the location for historical battles, and a receptacle for Rome's most disgusting waste. However, the Tiber River also concealed the grim fate of the most wretched citizens of Rome. Over the thousand year history of the Roman Empire, it was a common practice for criminals to be executed at the Gemonian Stairs before having their bodies flung into the river. 
But one of the most gruesome forms of capital punishment come to those who commit patricide. Penalty of the sack or poenic cole is when a condemned person is sewn into a large leather bag with an assortment of animals before being thrown into the river. It would have been considered a grave insult for your corpse to be relegated to the bottom of the Tiber River. However, that was the humiliating fate for four Roman emperors. But the award for the strangest deceased body at the bottom of the Tiber River has to go to that of Pope Formicus, who was put on trial as a corpse. This Pope was exhumed from his grave nine months after he died to be put on trial by his successor. During this bizarre trial, they hurled accusations and questions at this corpse before eventually finding him guilty and throwing his rotting body into the river. Considering I only scraped the surface, 8 out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I want to talk about the Blue Hole, also known as the Diver Cemetery. It's earned that name because some 200 divers have died here. The site even has its own cemetery keeper, a man named Tariq Omar. He's been retrieving bodies from the bottom of the Blue Hole since the 1990s, which has earned him the nickname, The Bone Collector. This 328 foot deep sinkhole is located on the coast of the Red Sea in Egypt. Danger and death are foreshadowed by these memorials for lost divers that are along the shoreline before you enter the water. To appreciate why this dive site has the most diver fatalities in the world, we have to understand the layout of the sinkhole. Similar to other blue holes, this sinkhole has incredibly steep sides, but at the bottom, on the far side, is an archway. The ceiling is 170 feet below the surface, and it's about 85 feet to pass through it into the open ocean. Archway is incredibly tempting to divers because the clarity of the water means they can see it from pretty far away. However, at 170 feet, it's deeper than the recreational diving limit, which is normally considered 130 feet. On top of that, the time it takes to pass through the tunnel beneath the archway takes longer than some divers are prepared for. At these depths, divers have to deal with the threat of nitrogen narcosis, which can make them feel drunk. They also have to be careful about their ascent back to the surface, which if they do too quickly could cause decompression sickness. Not all the divers who lost their lives at the Blue Hole have had their bodies retrieved. To those who visit this dive site, it might not come as a surprise to encounter remnants of these past divers in the form of air tanks, fins, or even entire remains. Those who were not retrieved in time or were at too great of a depth are considered too decomposed to retrieve now. One of the most notable deaths that occurred here was that of Yuri Lipsky, who was a 22-year-old Russian dive instructor. In 2000, he visited the Blue Hole with his video camera, which would inexplicably record his experience with nitrogen narcosis, which would eventually lead to his death. A dive site that's a little more than a graveyard. 10 out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. And today I want to talk about this icicle of death, also known as a brinicle. A natural phenomenon created by Mother Nature that acts like a comic book villain. And that's because with its cold, icy tendrils, it can be lethal to marine life such as starfish or sea urchins. This ice stalactite can only be found in extremely cold polar regions such as the Arctic or the Antarctic. When seawater freezes into sea ice, it excludes salt, making the remaining water even more salty. That super salty extra water gets trapped in the sea ice, getting super cooled until eventually a crack or hole releases it. As this incredibly cold, salty water comes in contact with the warmer surrounding seawater, it freezes it, causing this tube to form around the brine. The hollow, icicle-like structure descends to the sea floor, where it spreads a web of ice. Any vulnerable life that crosses its creeping path becomes frozen, trapped in ice crystals, killed by the brinicle. The result is a tableau of death on a frozen landscape, all without any consciousness or intent. 
and no mercy. Six out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I wanna to talk about the Skeleton Coast in Namibia. This haunting coastline is part of the Namib Desert, which extends from Angola through Namibia to South Africa. It's estimated to be one of the oldest deserts in the world, between 55 and 80 million years old. The Skeleton Coast specifically is located on the northern part of this enormous desert. This morbid name came from when the shoreline was covered in whale and seal bones, remnants from the whaling industry. However, today it's also known for its infamous ship graveyard. Over the centuries, thousands of ships have ended up stranded here. There's a specific reason it's notoriously deadly having to do with the geography of this region. Hot, dry air from the interior of the continent combines with the cold, wet air from Antarctica via the Benguela Current. The hot, dry air acts as a cap, preventing the cold, wet air from forming rain clouds. Instead, this desert has a seemingly endless supply of fog. For 180 days out of the year, there's a dense fog that covers the skeleton coast. This is why so many ships end up running aground here, the oldest of which is from the 1500s. After getting lost in dense fog, the intense surf would have prevented any of these ships from returning to the sea. The sailors that were inevitably stranded on the skeleton coast would only have one option, making their way into the surrounding desert, virtually a death sentence. Parched and starving, surrounded by salt and sand, sailors would have to make their way over dunes that were almost a thousand feet high. Even if they made it over the crest of the first dune, they'd be faced with over 63,000 miles of desert. Rescues were unlikely in this hospitable environment, so the dunes are probably full of bones. Today, the Skeleton Coast National Park is guarded by this haunting gate, which is topped by two towering whale bones. So I wouldn't want to be a castaway on the Skeleton Coast. Seven out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I wanna to talk about an earthquake in 1959 that buried people alive and formed a new lake. In the middle of a warm summer night, a powerful earthquake ripped through this valley in the Rocky Mountains. The earthquake was 7.3 on the Richter scale, occurring in Montana near Yellowstone. Epicenter was located near Hebgen Lake and resulted in a 20-foot wave that swept away cabins, trees, and cars. However, tragedy didn't end there because along the Madison River Canyon, an enormous landslide was triggered by the earthquake. The landslide moved with astonishing force, descending down the north flank of Sheep Mountain at an estimated speed of 100 miles per hour. Unfortunately, 19 people were camping by the Madison River that night, and they were instantly consumed by the rock and earth tumbling down the side of the mountain. In the days that followed, despite extensive search efforts, their bodies were never recovered, so they remain entombed in the landslide debris. Rock and earth from the landslide blocked the Madison River, causing a natural dam to occur. A new lake began to form, submerging the river valley. There's evidence of the disaster visible in the lake today, such as these submerged trees, which stand as ghostly sentinels in the now quiet lake. In total, 28 people lost their lives because of the earthquake and subsequent landslide. Today, the lake is known as Quake Lake, memorializing this tragedy. Four out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today I wanna to talk about the mystery of the Northwest Orient Airline Flight 2501. It's the only missing US aircraft in aviation history and it's probably at the bottom of Lake Michigan. This small aircraft carrying 58 people disappeared on June 23rd, 1950, when it was flying from New York to Minneapolis. The small aircraft was helmed by two capable pilots. It was in good condition and it had made this flight many times before. 
However, as this late night flight made its way across the Midwest, a storm was brewing over Lake Michigan. As the flight reached the lakeshore, the pilot requested a 2,500 foot drop in altitude, but he never explained his reasoning behind the request and it was denied. By dawn the next day, the flight failed to check in in Milwaukee and it was officially reported missing. The Coast Guard began an extensive search for the flight's wreckage. Soon, flight debris and personal belongings began to show up on the lake, but that wasn't all. The floating debris included human remains, which were discovered on Lake Michigan and on the shoreline. Individual body parts continually washed up on Michigan beaches for weeks after the wreck. However, it wasn't until 2008 that an investigator discovered an unmarked mass grave that included remains from some of the 58 victims of Flight 2501. They were buried together in a St. Joseph Cemetery without the knowledge of the victims' families. On top of that, a second mass burial site was discovered in 2015, also unmarked. The origins of these mass grave sites are a mystery, but there is now a memorial in place for all the victims that were lost. The exact cause of the crash is also a mystery, but it's assumed that the flight went down because of a severe electrical storm and high velocity winds. And despite searching for over 70 years, the location of the wreck has never been discovered. However, there are some 1,500 shipwrecks in Lake Michigan, some of which have never been found, so it's possible that the wreckage of Flight 2501 will continue to remain undisturbed at the bottom of the lake. Nine out of ten spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today I want to talk about a lake in China that has a thousand year old city that is hidden beneath the surface. You might be able to tell from its shape that it's not a normal lake. In fact, it's a man-made lake that was created in 1959. This hydroelectric dam was built, resulting in 221 square miles of the river valley being flooded. The name of the resulting reservoir loosely translates to Thousand Island Lake. However, these islands emerging from the water used to be the hilltops in this river valley. Around 300,000 people were displaced and their heritage was lost beneath the water, including the ancient city of Xi Cheng, also called Lion City. This ancient city was hidden beneath the surface of the lake for over half a century, but rediscovered by divers during the early 2000s. It's estimated that the city was built over a thousand years ago, which is evident in the intricate carving of this memorial archway. The stone archway, which might have looked something like this when it was first built, is perfectly preserved beneath the lake's waters. Alongside the ancient city, some 2,000 villages were flooded, and it's not evident whether the centuries of dead and their cemeteries were properly moved at this time. For now, this archaeological site is frozen in time beneath the lake. Three out of ten spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I want to talk about the origins of the Bermuda Triangle. Specifically, how this modern myth which captured the public imagination has kernels of truth which stem from a particular phenomenon in the center of the Atlantic Ocean. I am, of course, talking about the Sargasso Sea, one of the strangest places on the planet. This is the only sea in the world not bordered by land. Instead, the Sargasso Sea is surrounded by four strong ocean currents, and their circulating motion around this patch in the middle of the Atlantic creates an ocean gyre. It's almost 2,000 miles across, and the water here is six feet higher than the surrounding ocean. However, for centuries, sailors have known of the Sargasso Sea for a different reason. Ships would go from the turbulent open ocean to be suddenly surrounded by this serene glassy sea which extended from horizon to horizon where there was no wind and miles upon miles of seaweed. During a time when ships were dependent on wind in their sails, the eerie calm waters of the Sargasso Sea would be more sinister in nature. In his journals, Christopher Columbus wrote about this eerie stretch of ocean and how uneasy his crew was while crossing it. There are tales of ships drifting aimlessly, becalmed by the lack of wind, surrounded by seaweed. 
However, some ships would never return from this maelstrom of misery. In 1840, the Rosalie was discovered adrift on the Sargasso Sea with no evidence of foul play, but not a single crew member aboard. Until the 1960s, the Sargasso Sea was at the heart of the maritime mysteries and historical shipwrecks in the Atlantic. And there's evidence of this in pop culture and comic books of this era. And this book was released in 1974, which popularized the Bermuda Triangle, which has a notorious reputation today and is heavily sensationalized. However, it does overlap with the Sargasso Sea, which we now know is an ocean gyre that imprisoned sailors in windless waters for centuries, and therefore it has earned its haunting reputation. Six out of ten spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today I want to talk about this pond in Australia which is hiding a veritable chasm beneath its surface which has claimed the lives of four divers. It's located near Mount Gambier on the limestone coast in Australia. The region is pockmarked by karst cavities like Ewan Pond which is created through the dissolution of limestone. The resulting labyrinth of submerged caves is like catnip to cave divers. When cave diving became popular in the 1970s, people flocked to these unexplored caverns. However, the result was 13 people losing their lives on the limestone coast before 1985. Four of those deaths occurred at this innocuous looking pond that's hiding a fissure in the earth. The location is known for its crystal clear waters and neon green flora and fauna. The vegetated fringe gives way to this crack at the bottom of the pond. This leads into over 300 feet of dark enclosed caverns. In 1984, a particularly gruesome event occurred at Ewan Pond. Two divers got to the site early in hopes that they would be the first ones there, but they were surprised by seeing a car in the parking lot. As they descended below 120 feet in the dog's leg, they were greeted by an abandoned scuba cylinder and two regulators. As they descended to the narrow sandy track, they could see stationary lights in the distance. With a total absence of movement or rising bubbles, this confirmed that the divers below were dead. Soon after, the underwater recovery squad would attempt to remove their bodies, but this was proven extremely difficult by the scene that they encountered. The two divers had become inextricably tangled in their guideline. It had wrapped around their bodies several times, including getting snagged on their gear, such as this dangerous snap clip, which divers today say is a death sentence. The situation must have caused them to panic, basically inducing them with nitrogen narcosis, which could make them feel drunk. Eventually, their cylinders would have run out of air and they would have been entangled and entombed in the bottom of this karst cave. For the horror gift wrapped by this greenery, 8 out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today I want to talk about the Strid, which has a reputation of having a 100% mortality rate, which means that no one has ever fallen into this water and lived to tell the tale. This infamous river is located in Yorkshire, England. The small section known as the Strid is actually only one part of the much larger River Wharf. Just past the Bolton Abbey, which is an 800-year-old monastery, the river suddenly shrinks. It goes from some 30 feet across to less than 4 feet at the narrowest part of the Strid. It's a river essentially flipped on its side, and it contains the same water volume. It was measured at 213 feet deep at the narrowest and presumably the deepest point. That means that what appears to be a bubbling stream is actually deeper than 15 double-decker buses stacked on top of each other. If someone were to fall into this water that's been blackened by peat, they may truly never be seen again, not even as a body found downstream because of what's happening in this raging underbelly. Vortices in the flow will pulverize a body until whatever comes out on the other side isn't recognizably human. Over the centuries, many have slipped on the mossy limestone rocks and vanished beneath the surface. In 1152, a young boy was swallowed by the Bolton Strid when he tried to leap across it. Hundreds of years later, his death was immortalized in this haunting poem. 
Other notable deaths have occurred here because on top of everything else, the river also has a tendency to flash flood. My only life and death experience happened in a flooded river and the water wasn't even black. 10 out of 10 spookies. Yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today I want to talk about how a river in Ohio burned in 1969. Uh, yeah, you heard me correctly. The river burned, but not just in 1969. It actually burned 12 other times before that. The Cuyahoga River is located in Cleveland, Ohio, which is on the shore of Lake Erie. During the industrial boom in the United States, prior to any protective laws, a lot of rivers in America were suffering. However, the Cuyahoga River was so bad that it was a general rule if you fell in, you should immediately go to the hospital. The water was almost constantly covered in oil slicks and it bubbled like a deadly stew. The shores of the river were essentially used as a junkyard and it was commonplace to see bloated dead rats floating down this goopy river. If that's not bad enough, this toxic foam is from detergent chemicals and factory discharge. By 1969, the Cuyahoga River was considered biologically dead. And by this point, just a stray match could ignite the surface of the river. By the time the last fire lit up the Cuyahoga River, there were shifting ideologies in the United States regarding industrial waste. The national attention would eventually help push the Clean Water Act of 1972 and the formation of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And in the following decades, rivers across America were cleaned up. So this rating is for the century that the Cuyahoga River spent in toxic destitution. Four out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I want to talk about the pools of stagnant water at the bottom of slot canyons and one of the worst ways to die. Slot canyons exist all over the American Southwest, but we're going to focus on those in the Zion National Park. These incredibly narrow canyons are formed through millions of years of erosion where water rushes over limestone or sandstone. These cracks in the earth that have been shaped by water are incredibly narrow and deep. Their width can vary, but an extreme example would be three feet across at the surface and over a hundred feet deep. Even on a bright sunny day, a slot canyon can be incredibly dark at the bottom. Hikers squeeze through tight crevices and wade through murky water. These pools are remnants of rain from the past and a foreshadow for rain in the future. In this region of the Southwest, a flash flood can occur even if the rain is miles away, which means there might not even be a warning for hikers before the deluge begins, which is exactly what happened to seven hikers in 2015. Only one man in the group had any canyoneering experience, so while his friends took a class, he went and got a park permit. There was a 50% chance of rain, and the park ranger said they shouldn't go. However, the group made their way to the tight crevice of Keystone Canyon and began their hike. The inexperienced group was sharing supplies, which meant their progress was dramatically slow. Three faster hikers would pass the group of seven, and they would end up being the last ones to ever see them alive. The rain would funnel directly into these slot canyons as the torrential downpour began. The flash flood would snake its way through this crevice in the earth, carrying tree limbs, rocks, debris, and sediment. The hikers would have been immediately swept away. All seven of the hikers lost their lives that day, and their bodies were recovered downstream. The floodwaters recede, and all that's left is a stagnant pool in the belly of the canyon. Six out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I want to talk about the soggy immortality of the bog bodies. Some of the best preserved mummies in the world were found entombed in a wet peat bog. Their hair and skin are intact, but their bones are usually dissolved. Many of the bog bodies discovered in Europe are between 2,000 and 10,000 years old. Remarkable state of preservation is due to the unique composition of a peat bog. A bog is sometimes the last stage of life for a lake. 
They fill in with an accumulation of peat, which is partially decayed organic matter and vegetation. Peat bogs are waterlogged, acidic, and low in oxygen, which prevents the decomposition of organic matter, which is how it naturally mummifies a human corpse. We've even found preserved butter in the anaerobic environment of a bog. The majority of bog bodies in Europe come from the Iron Age around 2000 years ago. Much of Northern Europe was under a thick canopy of forest but bogs were exposed to the heavens, which made them a special place. They were considered borderlands to the beyond, which is why archaeologists believe that many bog bodies are a result of ritual sacrifice. Some of these waterlogged mummies show evidence of extremely violent death. They may have been sacrificed to appease the gods or spirits, and they're often found along other ceremonial objects. However, many of our questions about these ancient remains will continue to go unanswered. You can't really glean any DNA evidence off of these mummified corpses, and like wetlands everywhere, peat bogs are often being destroyed. Even still, you can't really compete with sacrificial deaths cocooned by the embrace of the bog's timeless peat. 10 out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, we're doing a Spooky Lake special on decompression sickness, also known as the bends. Many cave diving or deep sea diving deaths are related to decompression sickness or nitrogen narcosis. The two conditions are different, but related to each other because they're both caused by compressed nitrogen gas. Nitrogen narcosis is caused by the increased pressure underwater at significant depths. It leads to a buildup of nitrogen gas in our bodies, which specifically affects the central nervous system. While the effects are reversible, it can make divers feel drunk, euphoric, anxious. It can have them make bad decisions while at incredible depths. This is especially dangerous for cave divers because if they're under the influence of nitrogen narcosis, they can kick up silt, obscuring their surroundings, adding to the confusion and make them panic even more. While nitrogen narcosis is reversible, the next fear is decompression sickness as they ascend back to the surface. If they make this transition too quickly, the nitrogen gas can form bubbles in their soft tissues and bloodstream. What happens inside your body during decompression sickness is similar to what happens when you open a carbonated soda. If nitrogen bubbles form in your blood, they can damage blood vessels and block blood flow. Symptoms of decompression sickness can range from skin rashes to fatigue and joint pain, dizziness, and even in worst case scenarios, death. To avoid this, divers have to take decompression stops on their way back up to the surface, which allows the nitrogen gas to be released in a slow and controlled manner. Nothing compares to the decompression stops that saturation divers have to take after working so deep below the surface. These types of divers live and work in these extreme pressurized environments for weeks at a time. If these divers are some 700 feet below the surface, their bodies are fully saturated with nitrogen. To return to the surface, their decompression time could take up to a week and sometimes even longer. I didn't even have time to explain how we really discovered decompression sickness by building the Brooklyn Bridge. I've never been afraid of fizzing like a can of soda until now. 7 out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today I want to talk about a special kind of lake that's at the bottom of the ocean. These toxic lakes are so deadly to marine life that they've been nicknamed the Jacuzzi of Death or the Hot Tub of Despair. Their super salty brine actually pickles any creature unfortunate enough to fall into them. Brine pools can be found in different locations around the world, but there's a special pocket of them in the Gulf of Mexico. Millions of years ago during the Jurassic period, the Gulf of Mexico was actually a shallow sea that got cut off from the Earth's oceans. Eventually, it dried out and evaporated, leaving enormous landscapes of salt. When the region later rifted apart, it reopened the connection to the ocean and created the Gulf of Mexico. Today, there's a thick layer of sediment over this ancient salt, but it leaches out through cracks at the bottom of the ocean in a process called salt tectonics. The result are these super salty pools of brine that are denser than the surrounding water. 
Their salty composition is deadly to marine life, not only because of the high salt content, but also because these pools are anoxic. That means there's no dissolved oxygen, which marine life depends on. Creatures unfortunate enough to end up in a brine pool experience toxic shock and suffocate. Some of these creatures have been preserved in the brine for over eight years. However, the cracks in the Earth's crust leak more than just salt. Dangerous chemicals such as hydrogen sulfide and methane complete this toxic concoction. The pools themselves may be toxic, but the edges are fringed with life. There's an entire ecological community that exists on the crust of these salt lakes, such as these giant methane-loving mussels that thrive on the edges of this toxic soup. When I die, I want to be preserved in perpetuity and pickled by brine. Nine out of ten spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I want to talk about Jellyfish Lake and its toxic underbelly. This incredibly strange lake has over 5 million golden jellies. The lake is located in the Palau Archipelago, which has over 500 islands in the Pacific Ocean. Around 12,000 years ago, the lake was cut off from the ocean because of rising sea levels. However, natural tunnels connect this freshwater lake to the ocean, introducing salt water. That makes Jellyfish Lake brackish, a mix of freshwater and saltwater. These golden jellies have evolved to live here, making them a completely separate subspecies from their marine counterparts. However, the jellies have to stick to the top of the lake just to survive. And that's because this lake is stratified. It's a miromictic lake separated into three layers. The upper layer is called the Mixolimnian, where the jellies live. Below that is a thin layer of purple sulfur bacteria, which absorbs all the sunlight. At the bottom is an anoxic toxic monomalimnian layer, which is completely full of dissolved hydrogen sulfide gas. If any of these golden jellies dip to the bottom layers, they'll be suffocated in seconds. The jellies also have a unique migratory pattern following the sun from the east to the west. The effect is a giant wall of jellyfish that follow the sun like a sundial. The jellies survive off of a symbiotic relationship with algae that lives inside of them. The algae requires sunlight for photosynthesis, which is why the jellies stick to the sun. Some days, I just want to be a golden jellyfish floating in liquid sunlight. One out of ten spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today I want to talk about the eerie, deceptive nature of low head dams. Also called weirs, this type of dam can be found on rivers around the world. Even though ancient civilizations had their own version of the low head dam, most of the ones we see today were built in the 18th and 19th century during the Industrial Revolution. Oh yeah, they've also killed more people than any other type of dam. They've garnered the nickname the Drowning Machine because of the monster that lurks below the surface. The design of the low head dam results in a recirculating backwash at its base. Its relentless churn will drag people below the surface and make it almost impossible to escape. If you get sucked into the drowning machine, you'll be accompanied by debris that also got trapped in this relentless cycle. On top of that, air bubbles in this churning current will decrease buoyancy, and if the temperature of the water is low, hypothermia can set in extremely quickly. In 1975, the Susquehanna River in New York was unusually high, which led to a series of tragic events. Initially, two rafters were swept over the dam and caught in the current. Three firefighters attempted a rescue, but their boat was almost immediately capsized. One firefighter drowned while two others managed to escape. It's hard to believe, but the next day they sent another boat into the water to retrieve the bodies. It was capsized almost immediately, and three new firefighters were bobbing in the water which resulted in them sending a third boat in, and like every other boat before this, it also capsized. Luckily, during this third attempt, two deputies and a firefighter were able to escape the churning water. However, at the end of 24 hours, three people had drowned. Unfortunately, this story is not unique, and it's played out similarly hundreds of times. The number of deaths caused by low head dams has steadily risen in the last 60 years. 
In the United States between 2018 and 2021, 149 deaths are attributed to this type of dam. They look innocent enough and many times there aren't even signs to warn people of the danger. Frequently they're left abandoned and no one is held accountable for their maintenance or upkeep. There are better rescue crafts that can battle this drowning machine, but often they don't arrive in time. And sometimes the people who disappear in these submerged currents are never seen again. So for this relentless beast below the surface, 10 out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we do 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I want to talk about the largest waves in the world and their terrifying origins beneath the surface. These waves begin in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Portugal. They make landfall near the northern beach in the city of Nazaré. The tallest wave ever surfed here was 86 feet high, which is equivalent to an eight-story building. This is what attracts surfers from around the world, some who have died in pursuit of these enormous waves. The formation of these colossal waves is due to something hidden beneath the surface. It's a canyon, a nightmare fuel canyon that's 16,000 feet deep. It's the largest submarine canyon in Europe, and if you want to appreciate the depth, it's about three Lake Baikals deep. It's also 10,000 feet deeper than the Grand Canyon, and it's a super highway for enormous waves. The largest waves occur in Nazaré when a storm is brewing in the Atlantic, sending swells to Portugal. As the swell reaches the Nazaré Canyon, it begins to speed up and hurtle towards the coast. The resulting wave is already enormous as it comes off the canyon wall, but then it collides with the slower moving swell making a monster wave. This perfect combination of factors is what makes these the largest waves in the world. And surfers here will continue to risk their lives to beat the previous record holder for the largest wave ever surfed. That's why Nazare and its gaping underwater chasm get five out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I wanna to talk about one of the most dangerous roads in Australia and what might be one of the most dangerous roads in the world. Cahill Crossing is a frequently waterlogged road that is consistently surrounded by some 120 saltwater crocodiles. Every year, someone gets into trouble trying to cross this river during the wet season. And two people have lost their lives here to the crocodiles that are laying in wait. Cahill Crossing is located in the Northern Territory. The East Alligator River is affected by tides because of its close proximity to the ocean. During monsoon season, you can also get a massive inundation of water from the other direction on the Arnhem Plateau. This road is the only way to get between Kakadu National Park and Aboriginal land, which you need a permit to enter. That means that people are willing to take the risk despite the high water, as you can see from this picture where there's cars that are swept downstream. Sometimes there's over 16 feet of water at this location during the wet season. When cars get stuck here, the people trapped inside have to risk not only the fast moving water, but also the crocodiles. Sometimes people spend hours trapped in their car waiting to be rescued instead of taking the risk. Widely considered one of the most aggressive and deadly animals on the planet, the saltwater crocodile can reach up to 22 feet long. And they're only slightly less threatening when you see them swimming like this. In 1987, a man was actually decapitated by a crocodile at this location. He was fishing by the water's edge when his death was witnessed by a bus full of tourists and his own son. And then, in 2017, a man was swept away after trying to walk across this waterlogged road. He met a similar fate taken by the crocodiles, and his body was recovered a mile downstream. Crocodiles have been in this region for over 250 million years, and they're only responsible for two deaths a year in Australia. It's still a croc world, and we're just living in it. Six out of ten spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. Today, I want to talk about a magic trick where you turn a 10 foot deep freshwater lake into a 200 foot deep saltwater lake in an instant. Maybe less magic and more mismanagement which led to a real life disaster on this lake in Louisiana. 
In 1980, this shallow freshwater lake was located close to the Gulf of Mexico. The coastline here between Texas and Louisiana has vast ancient salt reserves beneath the surface. And yeah, if you were wondering, those are the same salt reserves that create the hot tub of despair in the Gulf of Mexico. Lake Pinyur was situated directly above a vast salt dome, which also contained oil reserves. The Texaco Oil Company decided to drill for oil here, and they set up a rig in the middle of the lake. On November 20th, the drill assembly became stuck around 1,200 feet below the surface and the floor began to vibrate. Workers evacuated to the shore where they had to watch the rig get sucked beneath the surface in a whirlpool. The lake was a swirling vortex of mud, trees, barges, boats, buildings in the largest man-made whirlpool in history. We just have to appreciate for a second that all of the water from this lake flowed into the sinkhole and the rivers that normally exit the lake actually started to flow backwards and also go into the sinkhole. It swallowed the entire drilling platform, 11 barges, a tugboat, many trees, and 65 acres of the surrounding terrain. Now you're asking yourself, where did all of the water go? Well, they accidentally drilled into the nearby salt mine, which was full of miners. Luckily, a electrician in the mine noticed that water began to gush from the ceiling. What followed was a speedy and heroic evacuation where 55 miners had to wait in line for an ancient shaft elevator that would only hold eight of them at a time. And yeah, this happened while the mine was also flooding. They managed to get every single man out of that mine, which means despite the enormous scale of this disaster, nobody died. What followed was a 400 foot geyser, which periodically burst from the mine as the compressed air was forced out of the flooded salt shafts. Once the lake emptied and submerged the entire mine, the Gulf of Mexico flowed up the canal and flooded the muddy lake bed. The backwards flow that filled the lake also created the largest waterfall that Louisiana has ever seen. Days after the disaster, nine of the 11 barges that disappeared into the sinkhole just popped back to the surface. However, the oil rig, the tugboat, two barges, a bunch of trees, and a bunch of land were never seen again. Now, it's the deepest lake in the state, the water is slightly brackish, and the only remnant of the disaster is this chimney. Five out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. And today is a Spooky Lake special about the deadly amoeba that's lurking in warm freshwater lakes. I'm of course talking about Neglaria fowleri, the brain-eating amoeba. And in case you're wondering, this is actually what the brain-eating amoeba looks like as it begins to eat your brain cells. But it does go through quite a dramatic transformation as it enters the human body. However, this cuddly little amoeba begins its life happily chomping on bacteria in warm freshwater environments. This can include lakes, ponds, rivers, hot springs, or any untreated body of water such as abandoned swimming pools, which have been left stagnant for long periods of time. The amoeba proliferates in the summer and you've probably come in contact with it. However, humans can only contract it in one way. It has to go high up into your nose and navel cavities. Even if you swallow water-containing amoebas, they'll get destroyed by your stomach acid. Your nose is an amoeba highway straight to your brain. Once it enters the brain, it transforms and begins to destroy healthy tissue and eat all of your brain cells. Studies show that many people have antibodies against the amoeba and your immune system will also fight back. However, it can be up to a week before you start to show symptoms and they're not especially unique. Symptoms include fever, headache, nausea, stiff neck, confusion, hallucinations, and seizures. The fever can actually make it worse because these amoebas thrive in warmer environments. Those infected usually go into a coma within a week as the brain swells and compresses the brainstem. 97% of brain-eating amoeba cases result in death. Most of the reported infections have occurred in the United States where there's been 157 cases since 1962. That means there's around four cases every year. Put that in perspective, there are around 4,000 drownings every year. So while it's important to remain vigilant and not put your head under in warm freshwater environments, you are more likely to drown than you are to contract the brain-eating amoeba. 
However, this little fella is absolutely terrifying, and what they do is nightmare inducing. So, 7 out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month where we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. And today, I want to talk about Pole Nabest, meaning Pool of the Beast. This strange natural phenomenon is located in the Aran Islands in Ireland. These three minuscule islands in the mouth of the Galway Bay barely make up 18 square miles of land. Polnabest, also known as the wormhole, is a rectangular cutout on the shoreline. Most people might be surprised that this is a natural formation, and luckily I have a geologist friend who can explain it. The secret of the wormhole lies in aerial images of the rocks of the island. The limestone here is riddled with vertical fractures called joints which show up as lines in the rock. In a process called karstification, water gets in between those cracks and dissolves away the limestone over a very long time. Although fractures in rocks are incredibly common, scientists still find it very strange that this particular shape formed where it did. In the summer, you'll find people swimming in the wormhole. However, locals often recommend against it because of how fast the ocean can turn. The best can also be incredibly dangerous during storms when the waves can crash over the rock into the cavern. In this video, you can see a tourist on the rock when a giant wave comes along and sweeps her off. She's immediately dragged down to the lower level, but luckily not into the wormhole. Not only was she injured when the wave dragged her off the cliff, but there were other waves continuing to batter her against the rock. Since there was no cell reception and no way to call for help, the tourist who took the video created a makeshift rope and pulled her out of that lower level. During another storm in 2017, two brothers were swept out to sea, but luckily they were rescued by the Coast Guard. Since it's located on a somewhat isolated island, and not as many tourists visit this location every year, which is why the death count is not very high. Unlike the Giants Causeway in Northern Ireland, which is one of the most popular tourist destinations, the salt rock can be extremely slippery with rain or frothing sea, which is how over 60 people have died at this rocky shore, some of them never to be seen again. However, the wormhole has the potential for becoming just as dangerous as it becomes more popular. 4 out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's Spooky Lake Month and we're doing 31 days of haunted hydrology. If you've been following for a long time, then you know that this is a lake by call stan account. And I just found out a new piece of morbid history. In case you're new here, Lake Baikal is the oldest, deepest, and strangest lake in the world. It's located on a rift valley where two tectonic plates are pulling apart. This is how it became the deepest lake on the planet, over a mile deep and with more water than all of the Great Lakes combined. I also don't think I've said this in one of my videos, but Lake Baikal is almost 400 miles long. It has a surface area similar to that of Belgium, and that combined with the incredible depth is how it holds 20% of the world's available freshwater, all by itself. Another unnerving aspect of Lake Baikal is that it's deeper than you think it is. Over the 25 million years that Lake Baikal has existed, nearly 300 rivers have been depositing sediment into the bottom. You would think that this would lead to the lake eventually filling in, but because it's spreading and deepening by over an inch every single year, the sediment just filled in the crack. That means some 31,000 feet of sediment could be built up at the bottom of Lake Baikal. Combined with the depth of the lake, that could mean that the rift floor is deeper than the Mariana Trench. Another unnerving aspect of Lake Baikal is its ice. It covers the majority of the lake with more than six feet of ice during the winter months. And this is what it sounds like. Despite the fact that people often drive on this ice in the winter, you can't completely trust it. Which brings me to a new piece of morbid history that I didn't know about. In 1891, Russia began to build the longest railroad in the world. It's one of the greatest engineering feats in history and cost around 2.5 billion rubles in the 1800s, which adjusted for inflation in US dollar is around $52.6 billion today. It's estimated that around 100,000 people worked on this railroad and most of them were convicted felons. Building the railroad around Lake Baikal proved to be incredibly difficult because of the mountainous region surrounding the lake. 
So for around 10 years, they abandoned this section of the railroad and used ice-breaking ferries to move people and goods. However, in 1904, a war broke out between Russia and Japan and it became critical to finish the railroad. They continued to use ice-breaking ferries until the winter of 1905 when the ice proved to be too thick. This is when they decided to build a railroad on Lake Baikal. This makeshift ice bridge allowed for continued connection during the conflict. It turned out to be an incredibly dangerous endeavor because of the unpredictable weather and the treacherous ice conditions. Massive cracks would appear in the ice, dragging wagons and locomotives beneath the surface. One of the most impressive fissures stretched for more than 16 miles across the lake. Japan had a heyday with this and published all this propaganda with Russian soldiers falling through the ice. It's more than likely that lives were lost, but the Russian government didn't keep a public record of fatalities. It's easy to imagine the wealth of history that's probably disappeared beneath the surface. But at this point, we at least suspect locomotives and the czars missing gold. I know I'm biased, but Lake Baikal is definitely 9 out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, it's almost the end of Spooky Lake Month where we do 31 days of haunted hydrology. And you know what we haven't done yet? Boiling acid. So I want to talk about Yellowstone. There are over 10,000 hydrothermal features at Yellowstone, including mud pots, geysers, and the highest concentration of hot springs in the world. All of these hot pools of acid are due to the violent subterranean plumbing directly beneath the park. Yellowstone is situated on top of one of the world's largest volcanic systems. The hydrothermal features are created when ancient rainwater percolates through the crust, getting superheated along the way. The water in these hot springs can reach up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. To put that in perspective, human skin can be severely burned at 140 degrees. To make things worse, a lot of these pools are not just water, but also consist of hydrogen sulfide, arsenic, and sulfuric acid. So going for a swim would be like taking a quick dip in battery acid. There's been more instances of severe burning and death at Yellowstone than any other hydrothermal field in the world. Which makes sense because over 4 million people visit this park every single year and some of them make terrible decisions. It might be the iconic boardwalk at Yellowstone that gives people a false sense of security as they enter the hydrothermal fields. But then again, there's really no excuse because there's hundreds of signs warning people all around the park. Also, this man went to jail because of this picture. The majority of accidents in Yellowstone happen when people leave the designated path to get a closer look at these geothermal features. Since 1870, more than 20 people have died in Yellowstone Hot Springs. One of the most famous incidents occurred in 1981 when two men were visiting the park with their dog. The dog, Moosey, got away from the pair and jumped into a hot spring. One of the two men dove head first into the boiling hot water to save the dog. Despite his friend Paul pulling him from the water within only a few minutes, he died in the hospital the next day. However, there are many people who enter the pools and are never seen again, such as Colin Scott in 2016. He and his sister left the path intentionally to find a hot spring to swim in. The mineral crust at the edge of these hot springs is extremely delicate and Colin Scott slipped and fell in. His sister stood helpless at the edge of the hot spring with no way of calling for help. They were unable to retrieve his remains because of a lightning storm in the area, and by the time they returned to the hot spring the next day, his body had fully dissolved. And then, as recently as last year, a park visitor noticed a floating shoe in the abyss pool. The plastic on the sole was able to resist the acidic waters and keep the shoe afloat. Using DNA evidence, they found the owner of the shoe, but no explanation for why or how he ended up in the hot spring. In some cases, people make it out of the hot springs alive, but then have to endure an extreme recovery. So despite how tempting these rainbow pools of boiling toxic acid are, don't leave the path. 10 out of 10 spookies. Um, yes, hello, there was one more thing that I learned about Yellowstone that has to do with this morning glory pool. Despite our contemporary connotations for morning glory, it was actually named after this flower. But as you can see, the color palette really does not sync up. And that's because it used to be blue, like the morning glory flower. People threw so much debris and garbage into the pool that it actually changed the chemistry of the water. They threw in trash, logs, rocks, and specifically a ton of coins. This blocked the 
the flow of the hot spring, which as a result lowered the temperature. The cooler temperature allowed yellow and orange bacteria to thrive which is why the entire thing changed color. They tried twice to empty this pool and clean it, but it was incredibly dangerous to do so. In 1950, they also artificially forced it to erupt so that they could blow out some of the trash. They found a pair of underwear, 76 handkerchiefs, and $86.72 in pennies. Um, yes, hello, it's the last day of Spooky Lake Month where we did 31 days of haunted hydrology. And I think today is a great day to remind everyone about why Lake Superior is so terrifying. This is the largest freshwater lake in the world, and it's been a vital part of a shipping network for almost 200 years. In that time, over 350 ships have gone missing, and only half of them have ever been found. On top of that, some 10,000 people have died just in Lake Superior. The lake is a giant icy graveyard that preserves human flesh. Lake Superior's deadliest months are between October and November. These autumnal storms are called witches. The winds can blow between 60 and 120 miles per hour, which results in choppy waves that can reach up to 30 feet high, which is the size of a two-story house. One of the worst storms that Lake Superior ever experienced was in 1905. 29 vessels were damaged or destroyed and 36 lives were lost. One of the worst tragedies of this November storm occurred in the Duluth Harbor. The SS Matafa was a freighter hauling iron ore and dragging a large barge behind it. They left Duluth on November 27th, believing that the storm wouldn't be too bad. Late into the night, the storm was battering the SS Matafa, and the captain decided to turn around and try to return to Duluth. With blowing snow, the ship was flying blind for hours. A reprieve in the storm revealed Duluth's harbor lights, and the captain decided to charge the canal at full speed. He ended up striking the pier and cracking open the hull of the ship. It was trapped perpendicular to the canal. Despite being so close to land and potential rescue, their cries for help were lost on the wind. Men were trapped in both ends of the ship as waves crashed over the vessel. The men were soaked as water careened through broken portholes and doors. When the gale receded by morning, the Coast Guard quickly launched a rescue. They encountered a grisly scene because nine of the crewmen in the stern had died from exposure. A few of the bodies were encased in ice and had to be chopped free to be removed from the vessel. Luckily, 15 of the crewmen were rescued and brought back to shore. Thousands of people in Duluth stood on the shore to witness the rescue. The deadly storm ended up being named after the SS Matafa. And that's another reason that the icy wrath of Lake Superior is 10 out of 10 spookies.